Welcome to Eclecticist. This is an investigation of everything, from a particularly British perspective, by two brothers who consider themselves to be relatively normal guys, and we do it one topic at a time. We are Benjamin de Campos, a designer and believer, and Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate. We generally choose a topic of interest, something that interests us, and spend a little bit of time researching it, then have a discussion and publish the notes, and wait for feedback. The main benefit of this is that it fosters a greater understanding of the world, and, uh, and hopefully it prompts further thought and discussion from our listeners particularly. The topic that we're discussing today is smoking and smokers. The deliberate consumption of smoke from burning organic matter predates recorded history and endures as one of the most popular forms of recreational poisoning humans enjoy throughout the world. From analgesic self-medication and spiritualistic ritual to overt displays of status and peer group inculcation, smoking finds friends and those willing to justify the practice despite the increasingly well-evidenced detrimental effects on health and the wallet. In the West, full prohibitions in public places are becoming commonplace, and social tolerance of smokers is diminishing in tandem. Is there value in seeking to preserve the practice or right of smoking? Is it destined to go the way of lead-based makeup and leeches? What accounts for smokers' cognitive dissonance? It is peculiar. Smoking is generally quite weird these days, I have to say. What do you think? Uh, yes, I, I agree. It's, I mean, within our lifetimes, maybe even within the last 10 years, we've kind of seen such a dramatic shift of attitude to smoking and, and smokers in general. You know, smoking was something that no one even thought about. Um, but now uh, I get the feeling that smokers are kind of stigmatized, kind of reduced to congregating in alleyways <laughs> during working hours uh, and generally kind of uh, looked down upon that's what I think. But why, why is that? I mean, I find it puzzling that <clears throat> they are looked down upon, and we do sort of resent smokers for smoking. And, and is it because we know, or we all know, the detri detrimental effects of smoking? Do we look down on them because we think they are, or rather we know they're making poor health decisions, and that we pour scorn on them? because we believe they're acting foolishly. Therefore, they must be fools. I think it's a combination of all those things. Um, I think also it's the result of successful marketing or lobbying or something um, that's kind of changed the sort of public moral zeitgeist. Don't you think it's, it's there, there's something like that? There's some kind of successful uh, manipulation of the populace to get us all thinking in this one direction. I think so. I mean, I think if we go right back to the very beginning of uh, smoking, especially in Europe, sort of mid 16th century, uh, smoking was exotic. It was new. And it was certainly an indication of status. Uh, people smoked not just because of the pleasant feeling of smoking and the, uh, the um, satisfaction of a craving, which goes part and parcel with an addiction. Uh, but it was, a, it was a fashionable thing to do, you know, without any advertising uh, and without uh, a sort of um, business-like uh, attitude towards it. It was simply new and exotic, uh, you know, in Europe in the 16th century. But, uh, of course, advertising has had a major effect on the perception of smoking. And, of course, it was always positive in the early days, in the early 20th century, Smoking was a wonderful thing to do, and I think it was probably very popular with the rich and uh, the wealthy. Uh, you know, it was uh, advertised to the point where you could believe it was good for you. And uh, it was, uh, you know, movie stars advertised um, cigarette brands and were always seen smoking. And it was sort of, sort of a, I think it was a, almost a countercultural appeal to it because you had young people smoking, like uh, Marlon Brando, famously, uh, and, and lots of famous celebrities would smoke, and uh, people would emulate that. And uh, I think advertising had a huge part to play in its general appeal. 
But of course, now we see hardly any advertising. I was walking in the high street just this morning, and uh, I didn't see any advertising whatsoever for cigarettes. I mean, the billboards are banned in the UK, and uh, television advertising doesn't exist. Um, I think magazine advertising still exists to a certain extent. But really, it's it's down to very small A4-sized advertisement posters uh, in the windows of news agents. And, and I think that's about it. I don't see any advertising anymore at all. The only advertising is other people smoking. Um, so I think it's ra- I think it's radically changed. And I think the the sweeping blanket prohibitions implemented by governments has had the biggest effect on the drop off in uh, smoking generally and the perception of smoking. And they've done a, a fantastic job in turning people off the pursuit. Well, that's what I was saying. I, I think that is um, that is the situation. It's been remarkably successful. Um, also, I think it is illegal to advertise uh, cigarettes in, in magazines. Um, I think in most print, certainly in the UK. Um, I think here I've seen smoking advertisements. I should also say that I'm in uh, Los Angeles uh, and Jeff is in London, for anyone who just joined. Indeed. Us. It, it's still a very English uh, <laughs> approach we take to our topic still. Uh, maybe not for much longer, but it certainly is at the moment. Yes, indeed. Um, so I think it is um, still the strength of peer pressure and um, uh, lots of other maybe socioeconomic reasons that people smoke. But I don't think um, people smoke because they see any good press for it. Although there might be still some belief that smoking um, is quite a machismo thing to do or it's quite cool. Um, it, it marks that point where you, you go from being a child to being an adult. All of those sorts of reasons uh, probably play um, a big part in it. But uh... Yeah, I think it's been massively analyzed. I mean, certainly the influence of advertising has diminished, um, <clears throat> obviously. So uh, I think, you know, everybody thinks about the reasons for smoking in terms of the psychology uh, and the psychological position of the the smoky and uh, the addictive properties of smoking in general. So I think it's quite interesting when you think about okay, well, you know, quite a few quite a lot of people smoke and they pay quite a hefty premium to do it. So what is the appeal? And the usual explanations for uh smoking range from psychological Uh, a predisposition to smoking and a predisposition to becoming addicted to the many chemicals that you'll find in in tobacco that's commonly available, all the way to peer pressure and uh, social integration and uh, experimentation and, you know, how others perceive perceive you to be, uh, you know, you think you look cool when you're smoking, uh, to uh, calming nerves and, you know, countering anxiety and just general stress removal, all the way to concentration and even uh, greatening your ability to calm your breathing, believe it or not. People smoke to, uh, to even out their, their breathing uh, in an attempt to reach an area of almost a meditative uh, calmness. But, uh, you know, there's, there are an absolute, uh, there's an absolutely massive range of reasons why people say they, they smoke. Uh, and I always find it absolutely amazing. I mean, it's just, uh, some of them are believable. Like, uh, some people say it's social integration in that I feel odd if I'm with a group of people who are smoking and I'm not smoking. They feel like they, uh, they ought to smoke with a crowd of smokers. So perhaps it's just the people you fall in with that, uh, that hammers down your, your, uh, subscription to smoking. And that, which I find quite, uh, that's quite convincing. Uh, and then to uh, a weight control argument, people genuinely believe that they are able to, you know, stay under a certain weight marker because they have the, the addiction, addictive qualities and the digital ritualistic manipulation of smoking to prevent them from filling their face with cakes. And again, I find that quite convincing. I can believe people believe that. Uh, but the big ones are peer pressure, a predisposition to the addictive nature of nicotine and the other chemicals, and uh, 
anti-anxiety, I think, uh, people who are really stressed. They definitely seem to be calmer when they've had a few cigarettes. I am um, going to be quite controversial there and say that most of that to me is crap. Um, there's probably elements of the thing about making you calmer or whatever, but I think in order to start smoking in the first place, it's it really is peer pressure or wanting to be cool. Because I think it's actually... Unless you're around people who smoke, it's actually hard to start smoking. I think you have to be quite determined to start smoking. I mean, I have had cigarettes. Well, I disagree there. I, I have to disagree. Let, let me just finish I've had what, many reports. Let me just finish what I was saying. Um, I have had a cigarette, and I remember thinking, well, I don't want another one. Um, you know, there's nothing there that made me think, wow, I really want another cigarette. And anecdotally, I know someone whose friend... Um, bought a pack of cigarettes and then spent all day <laughs> smoking these cigarettes in order for her to start smoking. Um, so she felt whatever pressure to become a smoker. And I think once you then are a smoker, then you can start giving excuses about, oh, it, it makes me feel less stressed or it helps me stop feeling so anxious and, and all these other reasons that smokers tend to bring to the table. But it's the starting smoking in the first place, I think, is the first brain fart of the whole thing. Of the whole enterprise. I certainly think that uh, most people justify after the fact, but I've had many reports of people who passively started smoking. That is to say, they will have been sitting with a friend on a wall in the rain, and their friend is smoking, and simply their friend offers a cigarette. There's no pressure. It's just something to do. And that's all. They, they were very passively introduced into smoking. And then they must gain an addiction to it. Because I remember getting into Guinness, <clears throat> a, a sort of a, a thick, stout, alcoholic beverage. And it's fairly horrible. You know, people are amazed. Uh, uh, Non-Guinness drinkers are amazed uh, at how people can get a taste for Guinness because it's so initially horrible, like, like, well, like all beer, perhaps. But uh, you do get into it, and then you can't remember how. <laughs> so I don't think I was pressured into liking Guinness, and I certainly remember not liking it initially. But somehow I got from not drinking Guinness at all to not liking Guinness to liking Guinness. How did that happen? I certainly don't recall being pressured into it. I, I just passively slipped into it. And, and there could have been myriad reasons for this that could have been the look of it uh it could have been advertising it could have been availability opportunity uh the the temperature of it my predisposition um maybe my ability to get over an initial rejection or perhaps i found it to be a challenge that uh i should get to like it i mean i didn't i didn't drink i didn't drink uh, 60 packets of Guinness in a single sitting. But I certainly did move from not not drinking, not liking it, to liking it. So it's it's peculiar. I mean, maybe this is part of the cognitive dissonance uh, conversation that we'll have to have when it comes to smoking as well. But uh, it's peculiar. I certainly think there isn't one factor, but perhaps there is one factor that, that marks the tipping point. It's a false analogy, because I think that... Um... You can be a social drinker, and it doesn't do any harm to your health. Whereas if you're a social smoker, you could argue it does do harm to your health. And I think the difference there is um, what we should talk about, which is the compartmentalization of a smoker's brain. Um, they know... Hang on, you've made an assumption there, and I don't understand. Okay. What do you mean you could be an occasional drinker and it doesn't harm your health? Um, it's just not the same thing. Uh, you, smoking... Are you, are you arguing that smoking is always more harmful to your health than drinking? Um, it's always harmful to your health, is what I'm arguing. You can be a social drinker, and in my strong conviction, is that you can drink and um, you can not get a telling off from your doctor, you know, if you have the occasional drink. Which I, which I, don't, which I don't think is necessarily true. Hang on, before we go down that road, there is good reason to think that um, if, if, if you smoke a little bit, that's worse than smoking 
No, no, no. If you smoke a little bit, that could be worse than smoking a lot. Um, your innards haven't developed a smoker's crust um, to protect the, the pink bits in the way that uh, an only occasional smoker wouldn't have that kind of buildup of defense. I don't know if that's true about something. I, I, I've had a look at a few studies along those lines, and I don't think they're ever super conclusive. Whereas I've also seen studies on smoker's crust, as you put it, and there could well be something in that. I mean, our father smoked for 21 years, and he fully believes that had he skipped the cigarettes for all that time, he'd be dead now. That's probably crap. <laughs> he, he believes this fervently. And it could, it could well have given him a defense in a certain funny way against other ailments no, that's, that that, that's could crap. possibly the, have affected the him. The only defense... Who knows? Hang on. The only defense that he has is that he's from a generation where there just wasn't <clears throat> the information around. And don't forget that as soon as there started to be these massive amounts of evidence, as soon as massive amounts of evidence started forming on the harmful effects of smoking, it took a long time for that to sort of reach public consciousness because you had the super powerful cigarette companies um, doing their best. Big tobacco. Yeah, d doing the, what did I say? Cigarette companies. Super powerful smoke. <laughs> no, I said super powerful cigarette companies. Indeed, called big tobacco. Yeah, um, who were doing their utmost to stifle that knowledge from getting out. And sure enough, you know, you had this, you know, the advertising and then all the, 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 the doctors who would come out and say, no, 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 there's this. It was virtually good for you. Um, well, they, they would say that until they simply couldn't say that anymore. A bit like you can draw an analogy with how the, um, the very powerful... The internet has buggered up all pub quizzes. You could say that. But also how the, um, the religious leaders had all this power um, until they simply didn't because what they were saying was just so much in contradiction from what we now know. And so they, they, they just couldn't hold that position anymore. And the same as with cigarette companies. So it took 20, 30 years or whatever. But certainly in, in our dad, in his lifetime, he would have grown up when s cigarette smoking didn't have the kind of stigma. It wasn't um, bad for you. Um, because it wasn't common knowledge. Exactly that. Indeed, absolutely. So they, they were always skating on thin ice, but they managed to uh, stretch out the, uh, the general delusion and uh, the agit prop which seemed to suggest that their product was benign when the, the reality is it's uh, not at all good for you. It's, it's one of those businesses that just capitalize on ignorance. Yes, it's uh, very uh, immoral in my opinion. And, and yet now they've completely turned around their arguments. You know, the, the cleverness of the advertisers now, it's, it's all about freedom. It's about personal choices. <laughs> and it's about empowerment. Whereas before it was, uh, you know, they didn't need to make that argument because they had ignorance to play with. Where do you hear that? Well, I mean, the general argument, the arguments I've heard um, through my personal research on why people smoke is be, it's a choice. You know, it's up to people to make their own decisions. They shouldn't have to be told. They have the facts. Thank you very much. And they'll make their own, their own choices and their own decisions. They're not just going to, um, you know, go with the flow like the sheep. And again, this leads on to our discussion, our coming discussion, our imminent discussion on cognitive dissonance and how smokers can know all the facts and yet continue to smoke, <laughs> which is peculiar. And also the advocacy organizations uh, or, the, or the rights organizations, as they call themselves, like Forrest, who believe that um, to tell the populace smoking is bad and let's ban it is a an infringement upon civil rights and that there's a there's a whole cultural argument for smoking and there's a human rights argument for smoking and all the rest of it but i'm jumping ahead i think we should we should focus more on the actual act of smoking i mean first of all why do people smoke and who smokes these days i have an anecdote i was uh sitting in a, a coffee shop uh, rather, I was sitting outside a coffee shop, cafe, bar. I, I don't actually know what you call them. A place that primarily sells coffee. 
and it has tables and chairs. What is that called? Is it a, is it a coffee shop? <laughs> I was at an independent coffee shop sitting outside because it was a rel relatively nice day. Or at least it started out to be a nice day, but it actually turned rainy and cold. But initially it was quite nice. So I was sitting outside the coffee shop with a coffee, um, trying to read my book. And uh, sure enough, somebody sat at, a, at an adjacent table and started smoking camels uh, in a blue little box, a cigarette box. And the smoke supernaturally was able to find my nostrils in a, in a direct ribbon that went straight into my nostrils and right to the back of my throat, tickling my throat. And I already have a cough, uh, which was amazing. And I, I was smelling the tobacco. And, you know, that person was presumably enjoying uh, his cigarette or rather enjoying satisfying the craving to smoke a cigarette at another table. And his activity was affecting me adversely. And then a few moments later, someone sat at my table asking nicely whether they could take the chair at my table. Um, and he struck up as well. And again, a ribbon of smoke found my nostrils and went straight to the back of my throat. And I thought, this seems crazy. These people are indulging in an addictive act which is affecting my enjoyment of the afternoon, of the morning, rather. And it, it just seems crazy to me. But then my perspective comes from someone who has never smoked. I've never felt peer pressure. I've never felt the need. I've, I suppose I've had the opportunity, but it's just been, smoking has been in a different universe to me. And I, I've never, ever even crossed my mind to do it as a, you know, a, a daily pursuit. So it's just bizarre. And I automatically found myself thinking, why, what, what led to these humans? Um, decision to smoke. Uh, both of them were older fellows, I noticed. You know, they were both pretty much in their 50s. Maybe one was in his 60s. So maybe they were um, exposed to all the advertising, which certainly was around when they were at an impressionable age. So you can put it down to that. I mean, they were not young people sitting next to me. They were older people. So maybe it was the advertising and maybe the reason why we've seen a drop off in smoking is because it's simply not seen any longer to any great degree. So, you know, apart from these two gentlemen who are sitting next to me smoking away, I didn't see anybody else smoking at all throughout the whole morning on the street. And I also noticed that I didn't see any advertising whatsoever for smoking either. And in fact, the only advertising I saw were signs that said no smoking, please, except at this independent coffee shop where I was sitting where you were able to smoke outside. I thought that was quite interesting. So I think we should talk about why people smoke. Why? Why? Well, um, just what you stumbled into there was another point that I uh, would like to raise, which is the sociopathy of smokers. Um, see, I would have a problem with knowing that what I was doing was pissing someone off. Um, and it's something that smokers seem not to, gen generally speaking, um, it, it's not something that seems to stop them from smoking. I mean, occasionally, you know, you'll get someone that says, do you mind if I smoke? And being English, I'll obviously say, no, no, go for it. You know, you smoke away. Um, but I think there's a certain element there. And But my further argument is if they have that sort of disinterest in in your comfort and or discomfort, um, then w will they have any respect for their own bodies? Um, and it's, it's no. And so... Um, I think we should talk about the the sociopathy and the disrespect they have for their own bodies. And well, I think I think the sociopathy is subjective to quite a large degree because this morning I was sitting there and I was being affected by this smoke, and it's you know I can smell the smoke and it's going straight to the back of my throat, but they cannot. You know, they have lost. I mean, this has been proven that uh, smokers, especially heavy smokers, lose the ability to smell. And, uh, you know, their senses have been dampened significantly. So they were unaware, perhaps, that they are affecting people sitting around them. And perhaps no one has actually explained it to them that, you know, even though you can't smell a problem, y you have a compromised ability to smell the problem, whereas other people do not. And they're, you know, 
very aware and affected by it. I wouldn't give them the benefit of the doubt. I mean, they're not, you know, toddlers. They're going to know that, well, when asked, if asked, I'm sure they wouldn't be surprised that their cigarette smoke um, will bother someone. Um, but, you know, they'll bury that thought. You know, who cares? Oh, no, no, they won't necess- They won't deliberately bury that thought. It'll just drop out of their mind. Well, you could tell them, look, you know, it's really, it's really upsetting me or disturbing me or it's adversely affecting me, uh, this smoking. Uh, can you, you know, s- stub out your cigarette? They may well say, yes, of course, sorry, I-, I wasn't thinking, and they'll do it. But then they'll just forget. And the next occasion, they'll do the same thing. And, you know, it'll, it would have to take many scenarios where they are asked by someone to cease and desist before they start realizing on a higher level that really, you know, smoking is antisocial and they need to do it far away in an alley um, at the bottom of the building. Well, I'm... I think it's just not, it's just not on the top of their thinking. Well, I'm going to be controversial. I mean, they, you know, there's the, the, the chaps I was sitting with this morning. I, I arguably, I was in the smoking section. They were, which is which is terrible when you think about it. Why can't I sit outside on a nice day? It was too warm inside. I was sitting outside, uh, but that's the smoking section because they're certainly not allowed to smoke on the inside. So they're on the outside, enjoying a cigarette and a coffee. Um, but it was affecting me. So, is that antisocial? Was I sitting in the wrong place? Well, it's all about freedom. In in my view, um, I think a smoker would probably be more likely to not care um, or not be polite about smoking <laughs> because they're a smoker. And in my view, part of their brain isn't working properly. Um, and so there's a good chance that they're not really going to be that gracious about someone having a problem with their smoking. Um, it, it's a kind of, there's a, there's a narcissistic element there. You know, it's all about them. But I also want to say another sort of analogy um, is how... Um, I try not to think about uh, dying, you know, it's a fact of life. I don't like to think about um, the, the fact of actual dying. Um, and I think smokers are the same thing with what they're doing to their bodies. It's the same kind of compartmentalization of, of their brain. It's, it's just, they just don't want to deal with that. Um, they're just not thinking about it. Years go by, they just won't think about it. Yeah, but they don't, they don't put any effort into not thinking about it. They just simply don't think about it. Uh, you know, they want to live forever like every, everyone else. I disagree. Woody, Woody Allen once said, he was asked by a, a journalist or a critic, do you want to be immortalized by your work? And he said, no, I want to be immortal, which I thought was quite good. But I, I don't think it, they're thinking, they're not, they're not deliberately stifling thoughts about their antisocial habit or the detrimental effects of smoking on their health they're not thinking about that i think they are their thinking is clouded and overwhelmed by the addiction of smoking um i i I came across an interesting paper an academic paper that i i found on biomedcentral.com which is a a really rich resource of publicly available uh academic papers on uh, all all scientific subjects and really interesting And it's called uh, The Forgotten Smoker, a qualitative study of attitudes towards smoking, quitting, and tobacco control policies among continuing smokers. And uh, this paper is interesting in in that it uses the so-called prime tool sets, which is a a suite of uh, tools that are used by psychologists and analysts uh, to try and work out human intention and motivation, which is quite interesting. And uh, the three points... Uh, that I found interesting in this paper are, uh, and I quote, uh, the most common reasons for smoking mentioned, uh, this is from the, uh, I think, a a few hundred interviewed smokers, Uh, the most common reasons for smoking mentioned were enjoyment of smoking, boredom, force of habit, dependency, stress, seeing others smoke, and association with alcohol. In discussions, smokers were very keen to openly discuss why they liked smoking. That's a a quote that just lists the reasons smokers give for smoking. And also cognitive dissonance, whereby smokers held beliefs about smoking which conflicted with their behavioral actions and led to rationalization of their behavior. This was apparent in many of the smokers asked. 
So in other words, they would uh, agree with you that it's, it's deeply a deeply bad idea to smoke and that it has major effects on your health and increases your risk to major diseases significantly. And they'll be agreeing with you and nodding while they're smoking. Uh, this reminds me of uh, uh, the religious who will uh, profess to believe certain tenets of their religion and yet act in a way in which would suggest that they don't actually follow the practices. And the conclusion of the study was, this study found that despite some smokers self-classifying as having high motivation to quit during discussions, they were revealed to have low motivation to quit in the immediate future. So this is the cognitive dissonance, and uh, this is just not peculiar to smoking per se, but it is what you largely find with smokers. And, and, and I'm, I'm, I think, is it because smokers are the people they are, or is it the effect of smoking on anyone? I mean, are smokers a particular type of person? Or is it, <laughs> is it how smoking changes you? I, I find that interesting. I mean, is a smoker always a smoker? I think um, a smoker... I, I think smoking... Giving up smoking is easy. And this is coming from someone who's never smoked. And uh, <laughs> I, I just think... You know, swimming the channel is hard. Um, giving up smoking is not hard. And I just think a lot of it is laziness. And I'll give you an analogy to this. And it's, and I'm sure there will be people who don't see this as a valid analogy, but we'll see. Our but it's father, an addiction. Hang on. Our father, um, he has drunk sh tea with sugar in it for as long as I've been alive. Um, and he, for the past, my entire lifetime, he's made noises about not putting any sh sugar in his tea. And he's just never managed it. He'll occasionally have a cup of tea without sugar in it, but then he'll go back to having tea with three tablespoons of sugar in it or, or whatever. And all it takes is a week of not, of, of not enjoying your tea. And then you're completely, you've broken the spell. And you and I have both done that. Um, and the reason why dad, 54, you know, however many years on hasn't done that, I think is just, he can't be arsed to uh, deal with not enjoying tea. Um, and I, yeah, but I mean that, that be, could be because of the way he's wired people who find it difficult to give up smoking. Perhaps there are casual smokers or people who smoke for boredom reasons who can easily give up smoking. And they do. And there are other people who are far more susceptible to the chemical aspects of addiction, where they just simply cannot. It's not a case of not having the willpower. It's just that the hurdles they need to clear are that much higher. And it could be an individual. Uh, it could be individual variation. You know, some people, it's impossible. Other people, it's easy. Some people have to put 10 times the effort in to give up and it's much more of an accomplishment when they do than other people so you know it really can be a relative issue you know just because it's easy for one person i think it's unfair for them to think to, for them to immediately tell all the other smokers hey it's it's easy it was a piece of cake for me the fact that you're not accomplishing it means you're lazy <laughs> means that you know there are problems other than having difficulty giving up smoking no it it it, it is easy um, you just have to. You just have to not smoke, and I'm sure you could accuse me. Yeah, it's, it's like it's like losing weight. You just have to eat less. You just have to eat less. No, no. I'm sure you could accuse me of not being terribly empathetic, but there are hard things in life, um, and if and that could be one of them. But for some people, well, it it clearly is. But I'm saying it isn't. <laughs> it's not hard, <laughs> you know. Um, rescuing someone from a burning house is probably a hard thing to do um for some people for perhaps some people. it's easy for others yeah easy for a fireman but uh yeah. it's just it's just they they just don't want to deal with it it's just you know i'm just not going to think about it i'm not going to think about it until i'll probably start thinking about it when i almost die and my doctor tells me that oh my god you have x stage cancer you really should give up smoking stage five St yeah stage five yeah, are you sure you're breathing kind of uh, news from the doctor. 
Well, there are statistics. I mean, the statistics look grim. The statistics are grim reading uh, for smokers. But obviously, everybody has heard of people who have smoked all their lives and they die at 95. So, you know, it's it's one of those things. You, you, can, you can build up a smoker's crust. You could have a, a built-in genetic um, uh, resistance or tolerance. Uh, or you could be the person who puffs a cigarette once generates a, um, a malignant cancer and dies a year later. You know, it's, I think the general advice is just don't start smoking. Animals run away from smoke, you know, in the forest, there's a forest fire. You know, you know, there's a forest fire because the first thing you experience is all the animals running past you and then the smoke and then the fire. So, you know, life in general is, is sort of not too keen on fire. And yet having said that, fire is a big part of the, ecosystem. Fires happen, and they seem to be quite an essential uh, occurrence for a lot of ecological systems. You know, life survives fires. Plants can survive fires. They do do a bit of clearing the slate and, uh, you know, mixing things up a little bit. So, you know, there could well be <laughs> sure where, arguments sure where you're going arguments with that. for it. Well, no, just that smoke is not... My point there is, is it's... Smoking is not necessarily physically uh detrimental in all cases all the time you know maybe because maybe it's good to challenge your is your, your well, no no because my, my 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 analogy there is that natural fires do happen and life can survive fires and sometimes it's good for the soil it's putting more nutrients back into the soil and you know it's it's not all bad that's what i'm saying it's not it, it may i think people have a point when they say look if you're going to blanket ban smoking in pubs, which are privately owned, then you're, you're, you're encroaching on the freedoms of humans. Is it really necessary? Especially when you're talking about grown-ups. You know, can, can grown-ups not make their own decisions? Uh, you know, I mean, we can't swaddle ourselves in cotton balls and, and just roll around the, the place. You know, everybody takes risks. You know, it's risk calculation. Life is risk calculation. And um, smoking could just be one of those things that help you get by, you know, help you survive. Well, we are pleasure-seeking mammals. Just going back to your um, argument that everyone knows someone who has lived to 95 and smoked well, no, since they I said 14. everybody has heard oh, okay. of someone yeah. living to a great old, ripe old age, yeah. even though they smoked. But that argument, um, I think, is... is is weak for so many reasons because is it really worth it i mean sure you can live to 95 but or, or whatever you know whatever they say but smoking really does do some pretty bad things um and yet you could still live a long time it does make you stink it does make your breath go crappy it does age you in terms of your skin um, makes your teeth go crappy, uh, gives you those funny wrinkles around your lips. Um, and those are just pretty minor kinds of things. And it, But it does, reading any Wikipedia page about any illness, the chances are it's going to say something in there about how smokers are at an increased risk of X. Um, so is it yeah, worth but, all but of yeah, those there things? Are upsides. What? The upsides are you look cool, um, you're exercising your freedoms, you're helping the economy, and you're reducing the burden on uh, social health care. Well, I'm not sure about that one. Well, you're dying earlier. No, 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 no. I'm... So less, less, less investment in palliative care. No, I've, th there has been a lot of chatter about the exact opposite of that, how the strain that puts on the health care, the fact that so many people are admitted to hospital for these life-threatening illnesses because of their cigarette addiction. Um. You know, I'm not making that up. That's definitely a thing. Well, I think in the UK, the NHS would agree with you. They pump a huge amount of money into uh, advertising the ill effects of smoking, and, and they're seriously trying to stamp it out. Uh, you know, the long-term effects of smoking, as listed by the NHS and uh, Cancer Research, Research UK, include, just to name a few, lung diseases, heart disease, cardiovascular diseases, heart stroke, circulatory problems, ulcers, premature aging, damage to the fetus, 
causing low, low sperm count and impotence, spontaneous abortions, miscarriages, uh, decreased lung function, black lung, infections, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, and that's, that is just a few of uh, the sort of cancerous effects of smoking. Uh, and uh, the, the support services include Frank in the UK, NHS Smoke Free Campaign, uh, the UK National Health Service, and Smoke Free, which is a sort of uh, a United States-funded uh, non-governmental agency, uh, Smoke Free. Uh, you know, the... Cancers are, are the big one. You know, 30% of all cancers are smoking-related cancers, whether it's directly smoking or passive smoking, secondhand smoke. Uh, and these cancers are terrible. I mean, they're, they're in the, the pharynx, the larynx, uh, the lungs, the stomach, bladder, cervix, you know, all over the place. And all provably linked to smoking. Uh, so it is amazing, you know, I mean, when you really think about it, yeah, exactly, <laughs> an absolutely crazy thing to do, although it is pleasurable. But again, the pleasure itself apparently isn't pleasurable. Uh, people who say that they enjoy smoking, they are not really enjoying the smoking. They're enjoying satisfying a craving. It's like scratching an itch. It's not the it's not the itch that's pleasurable. It's scratching the itch. And smoking, it's not smoke that's pleasurable. It's its putting an end to the craving for the nicotine and the various other unbelievably dangerous chemicals that you find in uh, modern cigarettes, including cyanide and uh, carbon monoxide. And amazingly, the filters in cigarettes, you know, you always see filters, cigarette filters on the ground in the gutter mm. and the cigarette paper and the tobacco has it's gone, yep. dissolved. Or, and you see the filter. The reason why you see the filter is because it's not made out of cotton. It's made out of glass fibers. And anthrax. It's actually glass fibers. Glass fibers, the worst possible thing for your lungs. You know, these are little sp spikes that get lodged in your epithelial cells, in your alveoli, and, uh, you know, around which cancer can form. Uh, terrible. And that's built into the cigarettes. Uh, that's, <laughs> ironically, they're filtering out all the bad stuff. Uh, and yet, you know, they're a little glass barbs that cannot be broken down uh, unbelievable just and then there's the bleach in the paper because the paper is white uh, you know trees are brown paper is white it's white because it's been bleached so there's bleach left over in the paper no doubt uh, absolutely unbelievable tar and uh, you know every possible kind of poison you could wrap into a small little tube uh, is there so it's, it's just crazy. It's that cognitive dissonance once again. I mean, people do know this. They have heard it, but they blank it out. They don't want to know. They compartmentalize it. You know, they just want to end that craving by spending a fortune on cigarettes. And My God, they're expensive. Yeah, they are. Uh, but uh, so, so again, it gives, it gives more credence to the notion that it's incredibly addictive to a lot of people. Maybe not all people, but uh, a lot of people become incredibly addicted Mm. Uh, to smoking and of course they will say that they have a high high motivation to quit and uh but they don't mm. money in the pockets of the tobacco companies who are com private companies out for profit so you know they benefit from people damaging their health uh which is also crazy when you think about it yeah i mean we should talk about um the kind of demographics and smoking but before we do i just want to tell you about the best ever smoking ad uh, I've ever seen. Um, and I think it was, um, it's from somewhere in the Far East, it might be Hong Kong or something like that. And um, it's basically, it's a kind of like hidden camera thing where these, a couple of kids go up to adults who are smoking and ask the adults for cigarettes. And then the, all the adults, you know, say, no, of course you can't have a cigarette. Go away, kid. And they go up to people, you know, have a cigarette? No, 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 you can't have a cigarette. And the kids ask, um, you know, why? And then the adult explains why they can't have a cigarette, going into detail about, you know, the health reasons for not cigarette smoking, uh, for not smoking cigarettes and, you know, the addictiveness and stuff. And then the kids just says, well, why do you smoke? And on every single adult, <laughs> or the ones they showed, they just didn't know what to say to that. They were just kind of like sort of speechless. So then the ad ended, um, you know, saying... Yeah. Why do you smoke? Honestly. 
it's it's easy to push that it's easy to push it off into the future you know you're doing something that you know is damaging to health but it's such a slow onset of damage and it seems to be so far off in the future that it's happening to somebody else. It's not happening to you because it's not happening right now. It's not like every time you put a cigarette in your mouth, somebody punches you in the stomach. That doesn't happen. It's not far Therefore, off. Therefore, <laughs> you're, you're, less, you're, less, you're less immediately concerned and you're able to put it off into the distance. It's like, you know, you wear clothes that you know are made in sweatshops in the economic processing zones in China. You know this. You know buying all of these products is, you know, uh, is, is exploiting people in the third world but it's not going to stop you buying the products and you'll find lots of ways to rationalize your way around that so we live with a lot of ills that we know we are um enabling uh but we do it anyway because it's not something that's immediately affecting us it's something we think we can make a decision about sometime in the future or whose effects we can push off into the future i think that's a lame-ass excuse for for smokers all they have to do is just think about it but they don't and they they won't <laughs> and they don't want to exactly obviously of course they, they don't want to stop smoking and so it's, maybe they it, think they're the lucky one and, who's going to live to 95 and it won't affect them at all yeah that's right and smoking stopping smoking is too hard it's too hard to do and if something's too hard to do that it's not worth doing yeah, and, and so, if you and if you, if you stop smoking, you become really fat and unattractive. And I think that's oh, I, that's, I don't believe that. I think also that if it's too hard to do, then it's not worth doing. I think there's a link between that kind of thinking and the link with smoking and being unemployed, which I think we should talk about. Well, I think um, before we go there, uh, just another list of reasons why people smoke from smokers. Um, this is from the website Eva Tees. Dot com. The 15 most common, common reasons, uh, according to this website, uh, are it's an addiction, uh, they're psychologically dependent, anxiety, it's a coping mechanism, a social integration, this is a bonding activity that makes it easier to talk with other people, uh, mirroring others, uh, as a young adult, it's natural to look up to others, so you know, you're inspired by someone you perhaps idolize when you're young, and they smoke. Peer pressure, this is when a person's peers smoke cigarettes, uh, you're more likely to begin smoking because of this. Uh, enjoyment of smoking, uh, this is the, uh, they don't actually enjoy smoking, they simply don't like how they feel uh, when they're not smoking, <laughs> they're less alert and perhaps more anxious. Uh, weight control, uh, this is one I've certainly heard, cigarettes reduce the appetite, which in turn uh, ma makes you less hungry. Uh, experimentation and adventure. Uh, to look and be cool, to feel relaxed, stress removal, to help you think clearly, and to relax breathing. Uh, the way you breathe makes you calm and relaxes your mind, and the ritualistic aspect of smoking helps you breathe, or helps some people breathe, a little bit more consistently. 15 reasons uh, smokers give. But uh, yes, uh, socioeconomics. How does that play into uh, those who smoke and those who do not? Well, I don't know, um, but just a casual observation um, of mine does show that people who are vagrants, unemployed, you know, shiftless sorts, um, tend to always smoke. Uh, maybe they just don't. It's to do with not having stuff to do, um, or maybe it's to do with um, being lazy. Smoking is too hard to give up. It's like for whatever reason they started smoking. Um, you know, you could make a case that it's really not their fault. Um, there are all sorts of outside factors, which is probably true. But now that they're a smoker, you know, that's, smoking is now a problem because they don't have enough money to support their smoking. Um, or they buy cigarettes um, at the cost of money to buy food and actual essential things. Um, and I think... Well, that, I think smoking... Sorry, go on. No, go on. I was just going to say, I think there's a straight line there between uh, being um, unemployed, not actively looking for work, um, and smoking. Um, well, 20 years ago and beyond, uh, there was a, a concerted effort to increase advertising for cigarettes and tobacco in less prosperous districts 
So, uh, you know, the more impoverished areas of cities yeah. were, were advertised more um, uh, enthusiastically by the tobacco companies. Uh, so I think that's, that's unfair. That's immoral. But also, it is. Uh, you know, certainly there was more, more advertising in poorer areas. Uh, obviously, not now, but I think, you know, just only as recently as 20 years ago, this was the case. Uh, and that's fairly terrible. But also, I, I think it's seen, it's a health decision. I mean, certainly continuing to smoke in your adulthood is a, a health decision that you're making. And it's a poor health decision. And generally, more educated people uh, will will take health decisions a little bit more seriously and will will factor in uh, anything that's so incredibly bad uh, for your health and make a better decision. So the more educated people are, the less likely they are to continue smoking. Not necessarily start smoking, but certainly to continue because it becomes very obvious that uh, you know it's it's a really terrible thing. Not just for for health reasons, but also economically, it's a, it's a bad investment in every possible dimension uh but for poorer people or certainly impoverished people you know they're they're susceptible or rather they're having to deal with uh, higher levels of stress perhaps uh so it's a coping mechanism uh smoking does calm you down i i i believe that i think it probably does for most people who do smoke calms the nerves it's familiar it's ritualistic so when you're under a huge amount of stress it can help I think that could be another reason why uh, poorer, less affluent people may may smoke more. Seemingly, I mean, I haven't really seen the statistics here, but I think, I certainly anecdotally, it seems to be the case. Uh, and in in my own personal experience, it seems to be the case. But uh, these could be the reasons. I think. And also, I mean, there are arguments about smoking and IQ. I mean, many studies have been carried out on. Are, are smokers making poor health decisions and continuing to smoke because they're less intelligent? Are they less intelligent people? Is smoking itself making people less intelligent? You know, is it, is it drawing you in and then dumbing you down <laughs> so, so you continue to smoke? Is it like some sort of crazy cat virus? Um, and again, studies have been, uh, studies have been made. Uh, there's the most famous study is the, uh, the one in Israel. Uh, with the 20,000 soldiers, where they tried to find correlations between the amount people smoke and uh, the IQ. And uh, they certainly found that the heavier the smoker, the lower the IQ. Uh, they found this correlation, apparently. Uh, hmm. And then again, they were all soldiers. Uh, you know, just... I'm not saying soldiers are more are more uh, partial to smoking. It's just that if they're... 20,000 soldiers isn't exactly a total cross-section through society. You know, they're soldiers we're talking about. Are you about. saying... This study was pertinent to soldiers. Are you saying they're dumb... anyone else. They're dumb to start with? No. <laughs> I'm just saying that it isn't... I mean, you have to be, perhaps, a particular type of person to become a soldier. Therefore, you know, it's it's not a... It's not a cross-section of society in general. But then again, it's Israel, and I think everybody has to do... I'm fairly sure you have to do uh, military duty in Israel. Regardless. Yeah, probably. Who knows? But uh, um, a quote from the study that I read was, scientists cannot yet conclusively explain the link between impaired lung function and cognitive aging, but it has been suggested that smoking could put the brain under oxidative stress, which causes DNA damage and uh, a lower, lower intelligence score. So maybe smoking actually does destroy your brain cells and make you dumber. And this was the, uh, the study at the Sheba Medical Center in Tell Hashomer Hospital in Israel hmm. uh, about five years ago. Hmm. Uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Yeah. I think um, smokers uh, are generally or are more likely to be embarrassed because they smoke. Um, I generally find it's like if someone at work, if they say they have to go and have a cigarette or something like that, they'll normally kind of look embarrassed about the idea but, of but that. endearingly so and and they're aware of the endearment which makes them continue smoking i they feel like an outcast so. they they feel as though you know they, you sort of go oh when when they when they sort of are cowed into a corner and looking up at you with big doughy eyes i'm so sorry i smoke i'm i'm evil and i'm weak uh, maybe give me a cuddle i mean i i don't they're playing think... a role I don't think that's um, endearing, but I'm sure lots of people do, and I'm sure lots of people also quite like the rough, husky voice. 
people might even like the smell of a smoker. Um, I know someone who really loves uh, or finds women smoking very attractive, which just is just bizarre to me. I find that so unattractive. Do they, do they watch? Do they watch a lot of noir films? I think there might be some element of that. Yeah, sure. Maybe cigarette with a cigarette holder kind of smoking. Hmm. But like you know, silk gloves that go up to the elbows. But you know, each each to their own. We're all different, so there we go. Indeed. Um, on the rights front, and how all of this uh, blank, all these blanket bans on smoking in public places, and of course, in the UK in October, uh, it will be illegal to smoke in a car uh, carrying someone less than eighteen, uh, the age of eighteen. So, uh, a child in a car, you are not allowed to smoke in that car, else uh, you face a fine. But the rights organization, the main one in the UK, is Forest, the Freedom Organization for the Right to Enjoy Smoking Tobacco. That's a forced acronym, if ever I heard one. Uh, their key priorities uh, from their website are uh, counteract the denormalization of tobacco, prevent further restrictions on the purchase and consumption of tobacco, lobby politicians to amend public smoking bans to accommodate those who choose consumer a legal product, um, establish closer links with other tobacco-friendly groups at home and abroad, build support among consumers of tobacco and other similarly threatened groups, and highlight the increasingly intrusive nature of big government in the lives of private individuals. And I have to say, I think they have a, they have a point. They have a couple of points. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, the pub ban is has always seemed crazy to me because I think that is absolutely stamping on the civil rights of the electorate. You know, to say, look, you, private pub owner, you cannot have anyone smoke in your private establishment. Uh, what? <laughs> Why not? If people are told, look, you can come in and you can smoke. This is your decision. It's up to you. I'm not dragging you off the street and stuffing a cigarette into your mouth. This is your choice. Come on in and you can make that choice. Instead, the government's saying, just no. No, sorry. Go and smoke in your own house. You can't smoke in a social environment. Uh, outrageous. And some of the, the reasoning, some of the reasoning behind this is that people who work in pubs, you know, it, 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 the secondhand smoke uh, drastically affects them. But again, they weren't dragged into the pub to work there. You know, you can, you can not work there if you feel strongly about it. So big government, nanny state, intrusion on um, rights, it's a tricky one. I mean, obviously, I think, you know, smoking is a bad idea, but to shoot people in the head if they're smoking in a public place, I mean, is that where we're headed? I think that's, uh, that's kind of worrying, isn't it? Because it's a slippery slope. Drinking? Drinking's probably a bad idea. Well, I, as, as we discussed, I, it's not as bad an idea. And I think I, I could easily see um, the government's rationalization for insisting on that law. Funnily enough, I was a victim of passive drinking um, this morning. Uh, I was uh, I went into Boots, the chemist, and uh, I bought some products. And uh, the person in front of me bought a fizzy drink in a bottle. And the lady at the counter dropped the bottle and immediately said to the person, I'll get you another one. I mean, this is all shaken up now. And, and he went, oh, no, that's fine. And uh, she went, okay. And he put it in the bag and walked out. And then I walked out after him. And then he, he, got, he got the bottle of fizzy drink out and he opened it up and sprayed me. You know, he was... <laughs> he had completely forgotten that that happened. And I was right next to him and he sprayed me. That's passive drinking. I was, you know, my shirt was stained with his fizzy drink. Uh, but this is rare. I don't, you know, you don't generally experience passive drinking. So... Whereas smoking, obviously, is offensive. It is literally offensive. Somebody smokes up next to you and you're forced uh, to breathe in the various chemicals of that cigarette. And I think that is unfair. It is unfair. I can understand that. You know, I, I, I don't like sitting around s smelling smoke uh, unless it's pipe tobacco, which I find fantastic. I can just breathe that in all day long. Um, maybe he's a smoker, which is why uh, he forgot um, that uh, he just dropped <laughs> he it didn't a few forget. seconds he earlier. He chose not to think about it. Yeah, indeed. Speaking of pipe smoking, um, you and I uh, both grew up with a pipe smoker. 
which was a normal part of our lives. Our father uh, used to smoke a pipe. And and I liked it. I like maybe that's why I like pipe smoke. Um but I do. Especially the more floral types. Uh I think they're really quite fragrant. I, I, I can't remember the last time I smelled pipe smoke. It's been a decade, I suppose. But uh, I remember it. I remember it happening in the pub in public and in pubs. And uh, I quite liked it. I could always tell. You know, you, you, I would go to pubs. I've worked in pubs. And I'm used to the smell of cigarette smoke. But then there will be a pipe smoker. And you can just, just that overrides everything else. And you think, ah, pipe smoke. It's so much. It's like a breath of fresh air. Weird. Amidst this massive cloud of cigarette smoke. That's so bizarre. I mean, I, I have not seen someone smoking a pipe in a long time. And I should also no, say. As I say, 10 years. I personally think the whole smoking ban thing is absolutely great. Because I love being able to go out or whatever, come home, and I don't smell like cigarettes. Uh, that is so great. And I think I, I'm trying to remember if it was here in this country, in the United States, or somewhere else. It might have been here, actually, in the United States. Maybe it was somewhere where people were smoking. Oh, yeah, it was. I was at some swanky Hollywood, um, you know, super duper swimming pool bar and they were smoking and when i got home it's like god i haven't smelt that in years the smell of cigarettes after after coming out you know coming home from somewhere um so but yeah i'll tell I, you my, my sorry yeah, go on. no no i was finished i was gonna say um that uh i'm i'm all for that ban i should also say what i was gonna say earlier about the reason why the ban is in place is what we're talking about earlier about the strain on the health service I think there might be an argument to say that people passive smoking, getting these smoking-related diseases, are putting strain on healthcare. And so, hey, pub owners, we don't want um, we want less passive smoking-related illnesses. Thanks, which I think makes sense. Yeah, I think the fact of the matter is, is that it's a really bad idea, and not only is it a bad idea for you, but it's a bad idea because it affects others. So I think the whole world is going this way, and it's absolutely inevitable. I mean, I see e-cigarettes everywhere I look. Yeah, I, me too. I, in the street, and just everybody is just hooked on these things. Uh, but at least they're not. It doesn't affect anyone else except visually. Um, I always look at them, and I think they look like the what I can imagine might have been trumpet players in the cantina bar in Star Wars. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's definitely a good idea to uh, to just stop. Let, let's just get over this <laughs> illness and, and it's happening and everybody will get over it. And I think, I think Apple, the computer hardware company is the largest company in the world because of smoking. And, uh, I'll tell you why. I think if you're not smoking in a pub, you're playing with your mobile phone. The mobile phone is the perfect substitute for smoking because you're playing with it with your fingers. You're looking at it. It's absorbing you. And uh, you're not smoking. So I think the rise of mobile phones has only helped reduce the, uh, the usefulness of cigarettes in a social setting. That's what I believe. So Apple owes all of their profits to uh, the ban on smoking. That's hmm. what I think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't. Well, I would disagree with that, but it's an interesting <laughs> idea. <laughs> have we covered everything? Uh, Is there I think anything we have. else we need to talk about? Yeah, should we, should we talk about the advertising? Because uh, I can barely remember cigarette well, advertising. Well, yes, because... But it used to be huge. Well, when I was a child um, in magazines, uh, just generally car magazines or whatever, there would be smoking um, smoking ads. Uh, in particular, um, the most memorable ones were for Silk Cut, um, where it would always be some kind of visual play on silk being cut, you know, as boneheaded as that is. But as a child, I didn't realize that they were cigarette advertisements because they had such a prominent um, Surgeon General warning uh, on them that said, you know, the usual smoking will kill you, you moron. And so I always thought they were actually anti-smoking messages. Um, and it was only in my adulthood in looking back, it was like, oh, those were cigarette ads. You know, when they when cigarette ads stopped happening. Yeah, I certainly remember advertisements with the Marlboro Man, um, and I remember the the worryingly um, cartoonish camel advertisements that 
seem to me clearly to try to be uh, recruiting uh, kids into smoking cigarettes, which seemed terrible. But mostly I remember the Formula One advertising in, uh, you know, on race cars. All race cars were so ridiculously plastered in uh, tobacco brands. It was insane. Gone player special. Uh, and of course, this was, this was banned in the UK in 2002. Long, long, long time ago. So, mm. I mean, I even, I even remember thinking. I remember when the ban was in the offing, and I thought to myself, well, how... Is this the end of Formula One? <laughs> how else will they find will, will they find all the uh, the advertising money? Because it seemed like there was no one else involved. It was simply cigarette advertising. But uh, of course, it's still around uh, despite all the scandals. Well, there is other people involved. Um, to go yeah. to go and watch Formula One, it's pretty expensive. Um, it, it has is. well the whole thing is just yeah. absolutely soaked in cash exactly and and the, there's nothing nothing cheap about any kind of racing no uh, uh, and sport. The, the punchline is although that, sport is it a sport but anyway uh yeah i guess it is a sport that's a, that's but a, that's a different conversation the, the punchline to that is, is that it did survive you know it, it got over the whole smoking thing it, it got out of that rhythm um which is great yeah, it, man- it managed to yeah survive indeed it's like lego surviving uh, personal computers and game systems they did well. Yes. I think that's pretty much it. I think we've said enough about smokes or fags or cigarette sticks, gob planks, <laughs> tabs, coffin nails, and tobacco tubes. I couldn't think of any other um, slang term for cigarettes. <laughs> that covers them. I, I kept meaning to find a, a profanosaurus to see if I can uh, pull out a few more, but I, I didn't yeah. get the opportunity. Well, I think um, for all you listeners out there are website is eclecticist.co.uk if you have any feedback uh, please go to the contact form and send it through to us and we're more than happy to take on suggestions criticisms um, completely random spewings uh, there that'd be great and we're happy to read them out on the show if we have a sufficient amount of relevant feedback Uh, the next show is going to be about the british monarchy which should be quite interesting Um, tell me about the outro music please ben oh okay um, well, this is your choice, so I haven't uh, practiced reading this, so this is... A... Well, we'll see how it goes. Uh, the outro music choice is something open source so we don't get sued. I'm not supposed to read that bit. Uh, the Grind by Justin Bieber. A jaunty... Wait a minute. Justin Marr? Marr. Marr, okay. Marr, a jaunty 8 plus 1 bit computer piece reminiscent of the heady optimism that caused our fingers to slip during the late 80s gaming scene. I don't know what that means. What do you mean by that? (laughs) Well, you know, when you were playing video games back in the 80s, you would play them for hours and uh, the sweat from your hands would literally make your fingers slip on the joysticks. Okay. And the 8 plus 1 bit? (laughs) It is. It's 8 bit computer music, but not. So it's sort of you know, there's a little bit more to it. It's not exactly 8-bit computer music. Oh, I see. So the plus one is like singing, which obviously <laughs> you, couldn't, you couldn't do with uh, 8-bit computers. Um, yes. Okay, available on MuseOpen. Uh, okay. Dot so, org. So what is it? It's The Grind by Justin Marr. Indeed. Okay. Good evening. Good evening.